It felt you wrote, is it or beha? Welcome to the Village Oak Tree for February 21st, 2024. My name's Terrence O'Donnell, and I'm back again to your village this week with something that might make you think a little. I have another interview for everyone this week. This gentleman is a political activist with his own website and platform called the Solutions Party. He advocates for serious change in how the U.S. government is operating. Please listen to our conversation today as he has some ideas on how we should change all of that. If you're a first-time viewer or listener, I've created a short advertisement from my podcast website for you to listen to now before we get into the interview. I want to take this time to talk to you about this podcast and to also explain how to find my website and what's inside when you arrive at the door. First of all, this podcast will remain free to subscribe to for the time being on all the major mobile podcast apps on my YouTube channel, Krana Biha, and for the first month on my Substack page at kranabiha.substack.com. I have set up two donation links, a tab on the Village Oak Tree webpage at rss.com and a donations page on my website at www.kranabiha.com. If you care to contribute, I use PayPal for your security. Think of it as me as passing my hat around at the end of my visit each week. Every little bit helps. If you like this podcast, please share it with everyone you know before it gets too late. My motive is not to profit off what I bring to you, but to make all of you more aware of what's going on around you, and I can't do it without your help. Now, I want to explain how to find my website. If you're watching this video on YouTube, the address is on the screen behind me. If you're listening to an audio show, please type in www.crann-na dash b-e-a-t-h-a dot com in your browser and search for it. The website name is Gaelic and means the tree of life in English. It may be a little hard to find unless you know what you're looking for. Then bookmark it if you wish to return again. There are no subscriptions to worry about so find it and enjoy it. I also have the RSS feeder enabled so if you like my blog post you can be notified whenever I post something new. Search for www.kranabiha.com in your RSS feeder and set it up. Users finding the website for the first time will reach the welcome page to learn a little about, about what's inside. There you'll see the homepage link at the bottom of the page. On the homepage, you can learn a little more about what Kranabiha means for a little bit of Irish culture and a little more, a little more about me in general. On the menu bar at the top, there are links to all the pages in the website. The blog section is where I post podcast newsletters, blog articles, stories, and poems. There is a drop-down podcast menu with links to both podcasts, a donations page, a bookstore page to purchase my published books, and a contact page in case someone cares to leave a message. Thank you for your patronage and support. So let's get into today's show. Belcher, everyone. I now want to introduce my guest, Evan Jaqua. He's a successful international business development specialist with an immense range of personal and work experiences in several countries. He's the creator of the Solutions Party, which I will ask him to tell us about. So that's that's my first question for you right out the gate. Um, you know, would you would you kind of tell us about this Solutions Party? Yeah, the Solution Party basically, um, I, as you said, I've um, I've had the honor and the good fortune of living in multiple countries in, in, for many years, including Japan. I lived in communist China. I presently spend most of my time in, in South America. And I've seen um, the world from a lot of different perspectives. And I've, um, as I say, I've had the good fortune of uh, getting to know uh, people from around the world. Uh, and in doing so, I've actually uh, learned multiple languages. I um, ended up getting my, for example, my master's degree in computer science at a Japanese university in Japanese and mm. lived in China and um, do most of my business now in South America. And I've seen um, just the world from a lot of different perspectives, including, you know, um, for example, how things work in communist China, how things work in different democracies that you know, that are around the world now or how things don't work in, in different democracies right now. And I think one of the things that uh, the starting point for me is Ronald Reagan once said that uh, government is not the solution. Uh, government is the problem. 
Mm. I think that that's a, a, a very interesting quote, but I actually think it's a little different than that. I think that in the final analysis, um, our problem, the problems in our country come down to our politicians, and not only in our country, but around the world. Yeah. And what is the problem with our politicians? Well, one of the things, one of the characteristics of the human brain, the human brain is a marvelous thing, but one of its weaknesses is, is the ease with which it develops addictions. Uh, you can name almost anything, anything that's out there and people can get addicted to it. I mean, we have addiction to alcohol, we have addiction to drugs, we have addiction to tobacco, we have addiction to video games, we have addiction to junk food, uh, addictions to social media. Uh, a whole, in fact, a lot of our economy seems to be built on, um, on uh, addictions because addictions are uh, a great business uh, to be in. I mean, in other words, if, if your customers are addicted to your product, you've got a guaranteed recurring revenue flow. Yeah. But probably the most addictive thing of all, I believe, is, is power. And as uh, John yeah. Boehner, the, uh, the former Speaker of the House, said, you know, you give people little power and they completely change, just like how people change when they get addicted to drugs or, or alcohol. You know, some people are, uh, you, you, people you've known, you know, before they got addicted were, were great people and their addiction just completely changes them. And even President George W. Bush alluded to a power being addictive. And we see power being addictive everywhere. I mean, for example, mm -hmm. It is people get viciously addicted to it. That's why the North Korean leader will send entire families to gruesome prison camps. Uh, that's why the Syrian dictator will drop barrel bombs on uh, indiscriminately on, on innocent civilians, including women and children. That's why Vladimir Putin is, uh, you know, kills his political opponents and invades his countries. But that addiction is not just uh, the sole property or, or characteristic of, of dictatorships or authoritarian governments in our country as well. It is in, incredibly, uh, to me, anyway, very, very obvious that our politicians, their first priority is staying in power. And, yep. and they will do anything. They will say anything to, to do so. And I think that one of the examples that we're seeing right now, right today, is we have, as everybody knows, an immigration crisis at the border. Mm -hmm. And parties should come together to find a solution. But instead of that, one party uh, that claims to be, you know, very uh, anti-illegal uh, immigration or I mean, is deciding to hold things up purely for political reasons because they think it will help them in November. Now, I personally don't vote for people so that they can spend their time thinking how to stay in office. Our politicians right now, they spend at least half their time just uh, working on their re-election. They're in constant campaign mode. And, um, and you know, if, if you hired a contract employee for example, for, for four years. And that employee spent half of his time every day just lobbying to get a contract extension. I don't think he'd be very happy. We want our politicians to go, to, be, to, to assume uh, you know, their elected office and to work for the people, not to advance their political careers. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, if you have reelection in the mix, that inevitably becomes the priority. And so if we want to break, I mean, if, if you think about if a doctor prescribed to you or needed to prescribe to you an addictive, very addictive medication, how would they do it to keep you from getting addicted? Well, they would give you limited doses spread out. And that's exactly what we need to do with our politics. And that's why I am uh, proposing that we completely eliminate re-election. Anybody elected to office will have one opportunity to make a difference, one opportunity to make their mark in history. They're not going to get re-elected so they can vote their conscience 
And uh, they, in fact, they can not only can they not be reelected, if they can run for another office somewhere down the road, but it can't be immediately after the end of their term because we don't want them using their present elected office as a as a springboard for their campaign. We want them to go in there and concentrate on finding solutions to move the country forward. Now, as I said, I've lived in communist China. Um, I have some uh, living in Japan. I actually uh, won't go into detail, but I even had a little experience, some experience with North Korea. Now, what do these countries have? Or what are, what are these countries uh, based on? They're based on the idea that one group has all the right answers and they don't allow any any al uh, alternate opinions. In fact, alternate opinions are basically a one-way ticket to the gallows. Mm -hmm. Their approach to politics, their approach to governing, uh, is extremely weak. You know, these leaders, they surround themselves with yes men, just like Putin did. Uh, they don't hear alternate points of view, and uh, that is a fundamentally much weaker approach to solving problems. Our diversity of thought is our greatest strength. And we want our politicians to bring a variety of different ideas, solutions, discuss them in a civil manner, take the best ideas from all sides, and move the country forward. Let's get the politics out of the, out of the equation. Let's get the stupid emotion manipulation out of the equation. Let's focus on the ideas. Presently, our elections are more about emotion manipulation than they are about ideas. And yeah. that is something that is greatly weakening our democracy and greatly weakening our ability to compete against these autocracies and authoritarian governments, which, by the way, by the way, are out to destroy democracy worldwide. And sadly, they seem to be succeeding. And yes, this, is a this is a critical point in human history because Autocratic governments, authoritarian governments are now arming themselves with technology that allows them to monitor people 24-7 and monitor, monitoring them in an automated way through AI. And so it makes it impossible for their power to be challenged. And the only hope, the only hope to win this war is to, first of all, I think we have to commit to a world beyond autocracies, a world beyond authorities. Just like Ronald Reagan said, uh, when he said in, in um, 1983, I believe it was, uh, move, he proposed throwing communism on the ash heap of history. And everybody, a lot of people just thought it was foolish, just laughed, but within 10 years, the Soviet Union collapsed. I think we have mm -hmm. to have a vision of a world beyond autocracies a world where people can decide how they want their government and their society to function. And the way we make that happen is by making democracy succeed wildly here and in doing so, achieving widespread prosperity, where prosperity means a growing middle class, where the middle class owns an increasingly large percentage of the overall wealth, which is not what we have now. We have the right. middle class, uh, basically evaporating. And you have now, I, I don't know what the latest statistics are, but they're pretty shocking. It's like one, the top one tenth of 1% owns like 50% of all the wealth in our country. And, uh, you know, we can't deny the shocking decline of our prosperity and our middle class. And that can all be reversed. That can all be reversed through a combination of reforming our politics, mm -hmm. getting special interests out of the picture, reforming the fundamental pillars of our economy, which means reforming our, 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 the most fundamental pillar of all, which is energy. It means coming up with a creative and adaptable workforce. And it means a market-based economy with businesses that are held to a higher standard, where it's more than about just making money, it's about making a contribution. If you're in business just to make money, you shouldn't be in business. You should be in business to make money through a, making a positive contribution to the society. So, I mean, that's sort of a long-winded, and I'm sorry about that, a sort of a no, long-winded okay. answer. 
But these are complex problems, complex issues, and it's um, they're all interconnected. Uh, whether we're talking about our democracy, our economy, our, our, our politics, and so that's why I, I try to give a in a in a big nutshell, a, a kind of a summary of what this is all about. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the thing about it is, I've done a lot of reading with that, uh -huh. and my. I um I listen to Tom Hartman out there in Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. I read a lot of his articles, um, take them with a grain of salt. A lot of times he just rehashes the same stuff over and over again. But a lot of his threads are pretty much spot on. Now, mm -hmm. he talks about Citizens United repealing that um, so that, um, you know, congressmen can't be bribed anymore, and things like that. And I, I, I agree with that. Things should go back to before that. And, you know, your your thing about the wealth gap is right on. Um, I think the statistics percentage-wise are even greater than 50% now, uh, if I remember reading something here recently. But at the same time, changing those. And, and you're right. You know, I've talked to a lot of people the last few years, and, and there's a growing number of citizens in the United States who agree with you that um, – Congressmen, you know, working on being forever candidates is wrong. There should be term limits of some kind, whether it's one term or maybe two at the tops, uh, maximum, and then that's it. You go home. Um, exactly. You know, the other part exactly. of that, you know, right. And the other part of that, too, is, um, you know, one of my one of my pet things is take their salaries and benefits that they're getting right now that federal tax money is paying for and revert it back to the was well, back to the original Continental Congress where the states paid their salaries and benefits mm -hmm. so that whatever district you come from, they're the ones who pay your salary. So you need to do what they want you to do, not right. you know right. working off the federal dime. And it right. used to be that way, but we changed mm -hmm. it. Right. Right. Well, you know, that's exactly right. You know, we want um, a candidate uh, presents him or herself for office. They present their ideas and we want the, the person who wins to go representing the constituents who put them in office, but also representing the people who didn't vote for them. I mean, I think mm -hmm. you have to, you know, consider uh, their needs as well and their their desires oh, yeah. that you go and you argue. Um, uh, your points, your ideas, and you try to make them happen. And understanding, understanding that democracy is a fundamental way to deal with disagreements. People have always disagreed. They're mm -hmm. always going to disagree. How did people dis handle disagreements in the past? Well, they sharpened their spears, they sharpened their swords, and they went at it. And the, 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 the best band of brawlers won. Right. But that wasn't the best way to advancing humankind. And we're always going to disagree. But the question is, is how do you deal with those disagreements? And democracy is a system to do that. Now, disagreements mm -hmm. are not a bad thing. Um, no. Disagreements, we want to have different points of view. We want to have a diversity of points of view. And sometimes a real bad idea can be the inspiration for a real good idea. But we mm -hmm. want to have the ideas flowing. Now, I can also say, you know, about, about disagreements, one in my own personal experience, I went to a, a, a small liberal arts college. It was liberal in every sense of the word. I um, was a, a Republican, just voted for the first time in, in California for Proposition 13. I was pro-capitalist. I was anti-Soviet Union. And uh, I was in a very liberal environment. And I got into a lot of emotionally charged uh, discussions with a lot of my fellow students. But mm -hmm. one thing I can say is that after all the heated arguing, after all the points and counterpoints have been made, after all the intense debating, we could go and have dinner together. We could go and have lunch together. We could go study together. We could go have coffee together and laugh together. Because even though hmm. we strongly disagreed, we appreciated the different points of view that we had. None of us doubted the sincerity of the other 
uh, of the other person. I mean, we all want the same thing. And this is something, by the way, uh, is universal. Whether we're talking about China, whether we're talking about Peru, whether we're talking about Japan, whether we're talking about Indonesia, whether we're talking about anywhere, everybody wants the same thing, freedom and prosperity. Yeah. And the, the, the question is, is what are the best ways to do that? Well, freedom, we want to have a democracy, a civil democracy, a democracy based on, on principles. And this is another very sad aspect of our country right now is the loss of principle. And uh, this is one of the things I mentioned in my blog, a country, returning to a country based on principles. Now, when I say principles, what do I mean? Well, let's think about an example of the Jim Crow era. If a mm -hmm. white man raped a black woman, well, that was just boys being boys. That was just boys out having some fun. If a black man raped a white woman, it was lynching time. Yep. And so you had the same crime. The only difference was the color of the perpetrator and the victim. But we have this concept called equality under the law where we don't focus on who did it. We focus on the act that was committed. And that concept is the very fundamental to civilization itself, because if you don't have that focus of, of focusing on the act committed rather than who did it, weapon uh, laws can be weaponized and they will be weaponized and they have been weaponized by one group against another. If you belong mm -hmm. to this tribe, it's okay. If you belong to that tribe, you're gonna die. And that is, uh, that is a formula for chaos. That is a formula for savagery. Yep. But this concept of equality in the law applies in other aspects as well. And for example, if you, if you look at um, our politics, well, uh, let's just suppose um, Hillary Clinton had been president and had caused the insurrection. Now, would Fox hmm. News do a... a uh, would Carl, Tucker Carlton have done a special called Patriot Purge defending Hillary Clinton on that? Of course not. No. Would have caused, caused, caused it, uh, called it the crime of the century. What if Bill Clinton had been a Republican? Well, probably none of the Republicans would have voted to impeach him. Probably all the Democrats would. And so yeah. it's the same, same thing happens. You just switch the names of the parties or the people involved, and all of a sudden something goes from being uh, you know, uh, A-OK -okay to being crime of the century or vice versa. And that yep. is a, a fundamental violation of this equality under the law, which is the foundation of our civilization. Once we start abandoning that very fundamental concept, then there is no uh, limit to uh, where savagery can go. And already, I mean, uh, you, you, we're seeing uh, this, this hyper-tribalism in our politics now, mm -hmm. and even talk of violence against people who've got different points of view. And yeah. that is extremely dangerous. I mean, at what point do we, uh, you know, uh, start pulling out the machetes? And, uh, you know, and, and by the way, uh, this demonization of, of people, you know, uh, I happen to know a lot of people across the political spectrum. And, uh, you know, very few people fit into a box of conservative or liberal. Right. And, uh, you know, most people have kind of a mixture of different points of view. And so, you know, we got to stop this boogeyman demonization of people with different points of view. In fact, we've got to celebrate, celebrate our diversity of thought and 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 uh, discuss our differences in a civil manner, take the best ideas and move the country forward. Right. No, I agree with you. Um, you're right spot on with everything I've been saying. Um, so, you know, kind of getting into that, you know, you talked about Fox News. So that kind of brings me back into one of one of my early questions I had for you. Um, what do you think we should do about journalism right now as far as rhetorical well, story? Goes? Yeah, it's really, really basic. It's really basic. In the old days, starting a news organization was not an easy endeavor. I mean, mm. if you wanted to start a newspaper, you had to have a you know, printing press, you had to have journalists, you had to have a way of, of, of distributing the papers. Uh, 
it, you wanted to start a television network that would require an incredible investment, you know, the, uh, mm -hmm. billions of dollars or even, you know, a radio station. None of that was easy. Right now, anybody can be their own journalist or, or news organization, quote unquote, if they have a laptop and a few dollars for a website. And yeah. so news, uh, the traditional model of news where you had, um, you know, uh, you, the only way you could get news were through these conventional sources. And these conventional sources, therefore, had um, a very a very lucrative business model based on, on advertising. But mm -hmm. when with the Internet, uh, that conventional business model does not work anymore. And that's why we're seeing, tragically, so many news organizations uh, failing. Mm -hmm. The news organizations that are not failing, what they've done is they've changed their business model from providing information to being in the business of emotion manipulation. Could you know, be. Fox News, Fox News, and their one of their um, their former uh, commentators, Tobin Smith, I believe his name was, wrote wrote a a book called Fox, Fox, Foxocracy or something like that, I believe, which he talked about. The emphasis at Fox News was finding. Uh, emotionally charging issue and and um, ex exacerbating it, taking advantage of it. And other news stations do the same thing. Uh, right. Journalists or, or news people have quit at um, MSNBC, for example, for that very same reason. Because mm -hmm. unfortunately, it's very difficult to make money now in the conventional news. So yes. what I have proposed is number one, let's certify our journalists and our news organizations. We certify doctors, we certify lawyers, we certify pilots, we certify database engineers. Let's mm -hmm. certify our journalists. Number two, let's give them a grade depending on the quality of their journalism, the neutrality of their journalism, the, um, the relevancy of their journalism. Um, the, uh, the objectivity, objectivity of their, of their journalism so that um, we, we will have uh, credible people. For example, if you see a, a fake video, let's say, uh, let's say somebody puts a fake video of you uh, kicking a cat, okay? Mm -hmm. If that fake video does not appear on any certified news site, people can conclude that it's just a deep fake. We're going to need to have certified news stations and journalists to be able to distinguish uh, news that uh, is it can be fake, and it's increasingly difficult to distinguish between fake and real news. So we need a sort of we need a certification process, which can involve a combination of education, experience, and evaluation by um, by a, a committee, maybe through the um, Society of Professional Journalists, and maybe also through AI. You could have different AI programs analyzing the quality of the of the of the articles. You need of the articles, the objectivity of the articles, and uh, and grading the journalists. And if their grade below falls below a certain grade, a certain level, they risk losing their their uh, certification. Number two, what we need is we need to have a. If you if you believe that, and I as I believe that the pen is mightier than the sword, we need to be investing in our journalism with at least the same urgency that we invest in our national defense. Maybe not the same amount of money, but with the same urgency, perhaps more, because our defense defends us against external enemies, by and large, but our journalism defends, uh, protects us against internal and external enemies. So we need to have a, a pot, a journalism, a pot of money, let's say, to which anybody can contribute, the government, corporations, individuals, and if somebody wants to become a journalist, they can get paid from that pot. And the better their articles, the higher their certification, the more frequently they, they write their articles, the more money they make. So we make journalism a viable profession again. We need to have uh, journalists, especially at the local level, because the local journalists have in history throughout you know, the history of our country have often been mm -hmm. the watchdog that catches yes. local corruption. And we need to have small town journalists. We need to have that become a viable a profession again, where, where mm -hmm. somebody who lives in a town of, of, of 500 people can be a journalist and can make a living and can, uh, you know, uh, 
earn more money by the relevancy, the objectivity, the quality of their articles. And so this is what we, we actually have to invest in our journalism because journalism as a business is just not working anymore. And the way that no. news organizations, quote unquote, I call them emotion manipulation organizations because that's what they are. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, they're in the emotion manipulation business. And that's what that's how they make their money. That's how they make their money now. They get people addicted, by the way, just as Tobin Smith did, said in his article, that people get addicted to this rage, rage-inducing nonsense. They they listen to the to you know to these news stations to get their daily cup of Joe in the sense of rage. And right. that exacerbates uh the division in our country. It, exa- it also makes our voters um, less uh, less informed, less well informed. We don't want voters voting because because of some emotion manipulating story that gets them all riled up. We want voters well informed and making decisions based on ideas that have been objectively and civilly presented. Let's hear the ideas. Let's vote. No more motion manipulation, no more political crap, no more stupid attack ads, no more razzle-dazzle marketing campaigns. Just say what your ideas are. Contrast your ideas respectfully with those of your opponent, and let's make a decision. Let's vote on it and move forward. Simple as that. Right. Well, you're right. And things things need to go back to the basics, um, something, that, uh, you know, something that we've lost track of here. And I agree with you. It's all on this whole business of uh, clickbait, what I call click, clickbait marketing, um, where they, you know, I was mentioning this, this very same thing to somebody earlier today, where these clickbait headlines is what makes them money. And that's what they run with. That's their new business model now. Oh, exactly. It's like the Oregonian. The Oregonian used to be a really good paper here in Portland, Oregon. Uh, and And now what they do... <laughs> Is they're journalists, they get paid by how many clicks they get on their article. And is that what yeah. we want our journalists concentrating on? You know, uh, yeah, writing some article about some irrelevant thing just because it'll get clicks? No, we want our journalism, we want our journalists to be reporting things that matter, to make mm-hmm. our society function better, to help make people better informed. That strengthens our democracy. And so we don't want them trying to figure out ways to make money by getting clicks. We want them to make money by, by concentrating on writing the best articles possible. Yep. Yep. I totally agree with you. You know, it's unfortunate that we're heading in the other direction and it's going to take a really massive wrench to, to get that turned around. Yeah, it will. It, it certainly will, but you know, it starts with the first step, and uh, and I believe, I believe the country is really ripe for it. I think people across the political spectrum are are sickened with what what we uh, what we're seeing. I think they're sick mm-hmm. and tired of it. I think they're sick and tired of the of the say anything zero principle politicians. Um, I think they're they're tired of not being able to trust uh, the, the news media anymore, and uh, I think that there's there's good reason to believe that, uh, you know, we can turn things around. And it's like Winston Churchill said, you know, Americans always do the right things after they've done everything else. And yeah, we're getting to the point where we've already done everything else. Okay. We recognize we can identify the fundamental weaknesses in our, in our politics, in our economy, in our journalism, in our judiciary. Okay. Well, let's, Let's uh, let's take some countermeasures and, and turn things around. And in doing so, let's make our democracy strong. Let's make our country prosperous. And let's leave the autocracies in the dust. Because to destroy the autocracies, by the way, does not mean sending cruise missiles and bombers over there. It means where you get a big enough freedom and prosperity gap between us and them, the pressure will inevitably cause them to collapse, just like the Soviet Union collapsed. Right. Nobody in these auto- autocratic countries or authoritarian countries likes living uh, under the thumb of these these cowardly bullies. And why do I call them cowardly? Because they are afraid of other ideas. They want to have a monopoly on the ideas 
They are terrified of successful democracies, which is why they are trying to destroy our democracy. There's a reason why Russian trolls go in and try to stoke people's emotions or why Chinese trolls or Iranian trolls, they are out to destroy our democracy. And, uh, and, and, and this even gets down to, uh, to uh, the, the problem with illegal immigration. I mean, for example, if we talk, if you, if you think about countries like um, Nicaragua with the little tin pot dictator, Daniel Ortega, or, or um, Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela, they get a double benefit for causing people to, to exodus from their country. They get mm -hmm. the people that are against their administration out of their country, and they flood the dem democratic countries, like in our case, the US, and what's happening in Europe, which weakens our democracy because it's such a divisive issue. We have yeah. to come up, we have to, um, we have to come up with a way. That's one of the reasons why we need to work toward a world beyond autocracies and uh, countries where you have a small group of elites with a monopoly of power mm -hmm. because they are always going to be the mortal enemy of the democracies. Hmm. Yeah. No, I agree with you. So let's kind of I'll work through my next because I'm working through a list of stuff here, more or less. Sure. And one, one kind of leads into the other one. So this whole business with the Supreme Court, of course, last couple of years, um, there's been a lot of issues. Um, so tell me a little bit about your ideas for judicial reform, given how corrupt our Supreme Court is right now. Well, this is, again, this comes down to our politics and where people put party above country. Now, our judiciary has no credibility if people think that our judges are just extensions of our political parties. In countries like Venezuela, in countries like North Korea, in countries like Iran, the judiciary is just an extension of the ruling political party and as mm. such has no credibility. And if our judiciary is seen as the same, which it is, sadly, I mean, yeah. uh, you, nobody can look at the decisions of the, of the Supreme Court or even of lower courts, and where it's so obvious you have democratically appointed judges voting one way and Republican uh, appointed judges voting the other. Our judiciary will be credible when there is no statistical correlation between the party that nominated the, the judges and their judicial decisions. Then mm -hmm. we can all have faith that when the judges uh, hand down a decision, it's not based on their political preference. And so what, what is the way that we, did, we can ad address this? Well, right now, for example, the president uh, uh, nominates uh, uh, Supreme Court justices. Well, I think that what we, what we must work toward is having a judiciary that is, uh, reflects a, a, a diversity of different judicial points of view. And for example, Let's take a look. Let's take the example of, of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Anthony Scalia. Yeah. They had very, very different uh, judicial philosophies, but you know what? They were also great friends because mm. the one thing that they understood is that the American public is better served when you've got different points of view being rigorously and vigorously debated. Uh, during this, this uh, the decision making process, we want a diversity of points of view in our judiciary, and so that should be the goal: is to enhancing the judiciary, the, the, the diversity of our judiciary, and getting the politics the hell out of it. And so mm -hmm. that's why I propose that um, whenever um, whenever uh, there's an opening, for example, in the Supreme Court or in the lower court that the president or whoever, the governor or whoever, will be given a list of different judges that will enhance the diversity, the judicial, I mean, what, when I say diversity, I'm talking about judicial philosophy of the, of the court, because that's mm -hmm. what we want. We don't want nine guys named Clarence on the Supreme Court, or nine right. clones of Clarence Thomas. That does not make our judiciary more credible, totally the opposite. We want to have a diversity. So I propose that, number one, that uh, the goal should be to increase the judicial diversity of our judiciary, not 
skew it in some partisan manner. Number two, I think there need to be term limits on things like the on the Supreme Court, um, because right now a Supreme Court uh, appointee is is like the equivalent of a of a nuclear bomb in the in the culture wars, which mm -hmm. by the way I I write an article about the culture war sham as well, uh, but uh, we don't want our judges being foot soldiers in the call or, or whatever you want to call them foot soldiers or, or officers in the culture wars right and so we want uh, judicial diversity we want term limits and we also i think that they should be rotated around every four years uh the judges are are, are moved from different uh, uh different parts of the country to, to others to uh, so mm -hmm. that you don't get one part of the country that's you know uh associated with uh, uh you know one political party and another uh area of the country the judges that are you know associated with the other political party we don't want that we don't want our judges associated uh with with politics or with a particular political party that just greatly weakens our judiciary makes it mm -hmm. less credible in the same way it makes it less credible in fact have zero credibility in countries like iran or russia or china yeah so that's that's those are the the ideas that i have proposed you know, and, and I think they're all good ideas because I, I agree with you. Term limits for our Supreme Court simply because of what's going on right now. And then, you know, that's the first I've heard of, but it's a good idea where, for example, if you were to take the Fifth Circuit Court judges and swap them out with the Ninth Circuit Court um, exactly. and tell them, hey, yeah. pack your bags and go, you would yeah. probably get a more diverse set of decisions. Exactly. Yes. Like you know, having, you know. Uh, a subset of the of the the fifth going to the ninth and vice versa. Let's mix it up a little bit. Let's not mm -hmm. have this stagnant partisan uh, group of judges in one area or, or the other. Let's mix it up and let's uh, give them term limits and let's work to delight, dilute the partisanship or get rid of it. But in the meantime, at least dilute it. So dilute that, it. Uh, yeah. And, and we want. I mean, we want our judges. Uh, to uh, you know, to hear and debate in a civil manner different points of view, and we don't want our judges all coming from the federal society. For example, uh, we want mm -hmm. to have uh, people with a different judicial philosophies, different backgrounds, different experiences. They bring different things to the table, and that will enhance uh, the credibility greatly of our judiciary, which is critical to having mm -hmm. a healthy democracy. Yes, yes, very true. So thinking about that, you know, there was there was questions about strategic goal. I mean, we know what the strategic goal of the US, US used to be mm -hmm. in, in that regard. Um, and I don't necessarily agree with that because everything changed for the United States after World War II. Mm -hmm. um, the big thing, you know, the big lessons from World War II not so much that we defeated the you know the Axis powers and all that kind of grass that stuff because mm -hmm. to me that you know that um, was more about good guys versus bad guys okay mm -hmm. all right the good guys beat the bad guys and yada 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 but the thing is you look behind the scenes at what happened to the United States in order for them to do that so we had pretty much a government takeover of almost all the factories in the United States to put them into making war materials and all kinds of good stuff. Um, the United States went into huge debt in order to pay for all of that stuff, selling war bonds and all those kind of things. And then you take that, and after the war was over with, all these corporations were like, oh, oh wait a minute, we really like that money. We want to keep that, we want to right. keep that gravy train going. Right. So they started selling all of their excess World War II surplus to countries overseas. Right. And all of a sudden the American government decided, hey, wait a minute, we want our cut. Well, we can't, right. you can't just do that. So, right. you know, yeah. now we have what Eisenhower called the military industrial complex right. and what he warned right. everybody about. Right. Uh, and in, in and now where you know where where we are now. I mean, in the 50s, they really weren't it wasn't really that bad. It was there, but it wasn't that bad because Congress mm -hmm. was curbing mm -hmm. a lot of that. Mm -hmm. But then Vietnam came along, and all of a sudden we had a Secretary of Defense who was 
hip deep in all of those people. And guess what? They went overboard. And right. what started out was advisors in the 50s and early 60s to a full-blown, over-the-top, Mr. you know, carpet bombing right. North Vietnam and all nine yards, all for the industrial complex to make a bunch of money and selling that stuff through the American government. And we, you know, our government latched onto that hook, you know, hook, line, and sinker. Well, you know, we go further into, you know, more recent history, and it was the same thing. Politicians mm -hmm. were hip deep with, uh, you know, within the military complex and taking kickbacks and all the other stuff. So all these districts that have war factories in them were, you know, bribing the poli local politicians and, and away we go. Um, and, you know, now we're in the mess that we are right now. But the big thing is, that's my my thing is the strategic goal in the 50s, if you believe Joe McCarthy in 1951 and 52, was communism, you know, the new replacement for the Axis powers. And so they geared up and all that kind of good stuff. And so now we had a new enemy. And it went on for a couple of decades. So then the Middle East happened. And now we got new, we got new enemies for the military industrial complex to focus on. And it's been kind of an ebb and flow ever since. But, you know, being a military veteran myself, in my young days in military, I just followed orders. I didn't ask questions. And then my last deployment overseas, I went to Afghanistan. But I didn't go in. I went, I went as a special operations operator. And we wore, they wear uniforms. They, you know, had made us grow our hair out, grow beards, no uniforms, no dog tags, no ID cards. And so I mixed with doing my job, I mixed heavily with the local population there. And I learned that the demons that the American media was telling everybody about back home was all a lie. I'm mm -hmm. like, no, they were some of the most wonderful people I've worked with. And I thought to myself, well, what's there's something wrong here. Mm -hmm. So then about maybe a third, a little more than a third of the way through the tour. We had a bunch of American reporters in bed with us for a month. And so they were there to do stories on what we were doing, which was great. I stayed out of their way for that. Uh, my job was to provide security, make sure that I took care. You know, I was a team sergeant. So my mm -hmm. job was to take care of security plus, um, you know, make sure the junior enlisted and all that were taken care of, so on and so forth. And I got everybody home safe. But meanwhile, because I was staying out of everything, I let the officers do what they wanted to do and let it go with that. Mm -hmm. But I got to see things from the back, back side of the bleachers, if you want to call it that. And I saw how these news reporters were behaving. And one of them actually came up to me and said that, you know, the officer in charge said that, you know, in order for him to do stories on my soldiers, he had, you know, he had to ask me first to make sure that it was okay with me. And I said, well, here's the deal. I said, I'm dead set against it simply because that information could be used against us back home. Okay. Um, at this point, I already knew some of what media was talking about us and it wasn't good back in the United States. But again, I kept my mouth shut and just focused on doing our job. So when this guy come up and asked me, he says, do I have your permission to talk, you know, talk to your soldiers. I said, here's what I'm going to do for you. I said, I can't stop them from talking to you. I said, but I can warn them. So before I let you talk to my soldiers, I'm going to warn them that you want to talk to them and what they can and, can and, can and cannot say to you to keep themselves out of trouble from the people back home. I said, I'm not worried about any propagandists hear from the Taliban, the Taliban has the least of my worries. I'm more mm -hmm. worried about what Fox News is going to say um, right. and, and turn the story around. <laughs> uh -huh. You know, and it just so happens that we had a Fox News reporter amongst the, the group mm -hmm. that we had with us. But the mm -hmm. point was, I told the guy flat out, I said, you need, let me talk to my people first mm -hmm. before we allow you to do whatever and let soldiers let make their own decisions about what they want to do. And mm -hmm. we kind of went from there. And of course, obviously, with you know, with my sort of negative attitude, as I was told later um, that I had, I did not let anybody interview me. 
or know anything at all, any personal information about me or anybody I knew back home. I said, you are not interviewing me. No how, no way. You know, mm-hmm. and I kind of let it go at that. Uh, and it kind of went from there. But like I said, I got a good perspective on because I talked to another one of the reporters. He was from New York Times. Uh-huh. And he flat out told me, he said, we've been told before we got here what we can and cannot report on. He said, mm-hmm. so whatever happened to freedom of the press? He said, yeah, yeah forget about that. <laughs> That's wow. what his words. He said, forget about that. Mm-hmm. He said, mm-hmm. we are here to report news to make American viewers more favor- have a favorable opinion on what you're doing here. Because without their, without their favorable opinion, you your guys are going to go home. I'm like, right. well, you'll be breaking my heart if you send me home. He says, no, you don't understand. It's not you, not you individually. He says, you know, the military in itself. If if American opinion turns against you in mass mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. of our reporting, they're going to pull all you guys out. I'm like, and that would be a bad thing. He said, well, depends on who you ask, and he let it go right. with that. Uh huh. Uh huh. You know, so I'm like, I'm, 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 you know, right then and there, my conversations with them guys were very, you know, it really turned me around and made me view this whole thing of what we were doing over there with a completely different viewpoint. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started asking a lot of questions of my Afghan, you know, compatriots that I work with. I started asking their opinions about things. And yeah, my, my whole viewpoint was completely turned around. I came home uh-huh. with a different, completely different mental mindset. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. You know, and it, you know, and it's it's you know, it's it's really uh, turned me around the other way too since then because that was twenty years ago, and uh-huh. my opinions haven't changed. Uh-huh. If anything, they've gotten worse. Okay. <laughs> uh huh. Well, that's uh, that's fascinating, but I think that gets back to one of the reasons why we want. Um, our journalists to, uh, you know, be have their feet held to the fire and writing right. uh, objective and relevant and well-written articles and, and you know, letting the chips fall where they may. And, uh, you know, the, the American people need to be accurately informed and that involves right. both good and bad, because if not, then we're no better than what they're doing in Russia now. I mean, you know, exactly. what they talk about nothing about good news on the front when exact when it, everybody knows. I mean, everybody outside of Russia knows that it's uh, it's exactly the opposite. In fact, I have a, a, a business associate in Russia, but uh, he's pretty much given me uh, the silent treatment recently because he's so concerned about me saying something that will uh, uh, contradict the official party line and uh-huh. that. Uh, you know, you might uh, get in trouble for even, I mean, you like to think that our conversations are encrypted, but, you know, he's just uh, not willing to take that chance. But we uh-huh. want our journalists to uh, to be encouraged and to um, feel a sense of obligation to reporting objectively in, in a relevant way and truthfully and, uh, you know, reporting the information to American people because American people who hold the power in this country, who still hold the power in the country, need to know. And right. I um, I personally, uh, you know, feel that uh, we made a, a tragic mistake uh, uh, withdrawing from Afghanistan. We, we basically have sent the country, or handed the country over to a democracy-hating uh, group, a, the- a theocracy. Right. And, uh, and, you know, we... I, I think that uh, while uh, I think that things could have been done much differently, much, much differently. And uh, I'm, I'm very sad uh, for the Afghan people because uh, it's a, a right. vicious, vicious theocracy. And uh, it's very sad. You know, one, I think one of the things that really bothers me more than anything, you know, as I've gone around the world, is just seeing how much human talent is wasted. We talk about wasted resources. The greatest wasted resource of them all is uh, is human talent. So many people uh, never get a chance. In fact, maybe the majority of people never get a chance to achieve their, their potential because of uh, the circumstances of their upbringing or their gender or their race or their religion. 
And I think we want to work toward a world where everybody has a chance to uh, achieve, achieve their potential. And that should be thought of as a very fundamental human right. And mm. uh, so, I mean, that's one of the things uh, that I also write about is, uh, you know, it all comes down to uh, really, um, as I say, uh, democracy uh, has its flaws. Just as uh, Winston Churchill said, the greatest argument against democracy is a <laughs> is a five minute conversation with the average voter. Well, that's true, but right. we can improve upon that. We can give voters incentives to learn the issues and to vote, and we can give politicians incentives to tell the truth and to present their ideas in a civil manner, and and. Um, giving our politics or uh, having our politicians be making it impossible for them to become addicted to power we can do all this it's mm -hmm. within our power and a democracy a prosperous democracy that um that uh, in which people can live freely and achieve their their potential regardless of their 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 the, the place where they were born or the color of their skin or their religion uh that is fundamentally much more powerful than the alternative where you have a small group of elites or one one guy running the country mm -hmm. and if our country realizes its potential uh, economic potential through uh, through the economic reforms that i i have proposed and the political reforms mm -hmm. um over the long term we're gonna we're gonna beat we're gonna and we're gonna win against autocracy just like we, you know, we, we, the Soviet Union collapsed not because we, we sent over, you know, nuclear bombs and, and cruise missiles. It collapsed because of the freedom and prosperity gap that exists between them and us. The autocracies right. are fundamentally very weak. You know, when you hear people talking about some autocratic leader being a strong leader, it's totally the opposite. They're weak, cowardly bullies who are afraid of a competition of ideas. They're not strong leaders. They use the tools of government to stay in power, to feed their addiction to power, but they are not strong leaders. Strong leader does not fear competition of ideas. And that's what we want. We want a healthy competition of ideas uh, expressed in a civil manner accurately, and then having people going, uh, being elected to office and implementing those ideas or fighting for those ideas in a civil manner and compromising, but moving the country forward. And so that's yeah. the vision. It's not about, um, you know, uh, uh, winning this through uh, military means. It's uh, talking about winning it through having a fundamentally much more superior way of doing things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, think about that. I'll give you an example because I read this this morning. Mm -hmm. So you know who Victor Orban is, right? Mm -hmm. Of course. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The so, quote unquote strong leader. Which is totally yeah. the opposite. Totally the opposite. Right. Exactly. See, so you know, he's 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 been one of the role models for these um hard right conservatives here in this country. They feeded him at dinners and and various, you know, let him talk to them and all kinds of stuff. Well, there was a news report this morning saying that he's in big trouble over there right now. Um mm -hmm. and he's starting to lose his credibility and popularity and various other things because of his um, negative dealings with the EU and, and various other things within his own country. So they're starting to kind of push back a little bit on him. So, it, and it goes back to what you were saying about the Russians. You know, Russia went as far as they could go with it. And all of a sudden, boom, they, they imploded and they are where they are right now. Of course, Putin is trying to bring it all back. Um, you know, good luck with that. Of course, now he's scared Estonia this morning. Um, and that's going to be uh, that's going to be a thing for a couple of days in the in the news feeds. Uh, I mean, the only reason I say that is because of Donald Trump, what he said. So now the PM from Estonia um, said something back regarding that. So now Putin has put the PM on a on a terrorist watch list this morning. So mm -hmm. like, okay, you know, all this back and forth here. He said he he said she said. They're this and pointing fingers and all this kind of stuff. So I got to, you know, I'm kind of wondering how this is going to work out. Meanwhile, um, here back at home, and it's everything you said, you know, I had several things outlined, you know, to talk about, and you pretty much covered everything. 
And that's that's really good. I didn't I didn't really have to come right after you like a journalist and say, well, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? You just kind of went right through the whole the whole program. And I think that's great. Uh, well, I, you know, I, I, I truly appreciate the opportunity. I feel a lot of passion about this. I think it's a critical time in our history. And I think, uh, you know, the first step is is having open discussion like this and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, ins having mutual inspiration and, and moving things forward in a positive spirit where we celebrate our differences. We celebrate our different ideas and we we constantly we, we respect each other. We we're civil toward each other. We base our beliefs yeah. on principles. Right. I mean, my. My political leanings, I tell people I'm kind of center right, you know, mm -hmm. a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, my brother is extreme right, but we don't agree on, and you know, we have my brother and I haven't agreed on anything since we were kids, so that's no surprise. Um, but but that's that's how the country is, and it goes back to what you were saying, is that we we have to be able to agree to disagree and still get along with each other, okay, and and and, and mutually inspire each other. I mean, that's yeah. the key. The different points of view are a source of our strength. They are a source of our strength. They're not a source of weakness. We've got to always remember that. And so that's why I enjoy, I mean, I know people who are, uh, you know, uh, extreme uh, on left and people on the extreme right. But mm -hmm. um, I don't doubt their sincerity. They all want the same. We all want the same thing. And, uh, yeah. and you know, it, there's... Um, there is a lot of interest in uh, the, the dem enemies of democracy want us to hate each other. They want us to tear each other apart. They want us to be tribal. Uh, mm -hmm. This, you know, this is so exact when they, they want us to, you know, when we talk about, or when you hear some politicians say, well, we got to have a divorce. We're going to break the country into red and blue. <laughs> I mean, I think for one thing that's treasonous, but number two, you know what? The politics of division are never-ending battle to nowhere because yeah. I can guarantee you, if we broke into red and blue states, okay, well, pretty soon within those red states, you're going to get disagreements, and amongst those red states, you're going to get disagreements, and those what seeming like right now seem to be insignificant differences will become eventually fight to the death, mortal differences, and yes. you know it, it, it's not like you're going to break the country into blue states. And red states, and we're going to have a blue Garden of Eden and a red Garden of Eden. No, they're going to people. People, no. you're going to get disagreements within the red states and amongst the red states, and vice versa in the blue states. We have they're already doing it. Exactly. Yes. Look <laughs> at what's happening in the in just yeah. the Republican Party right now, and and this idea that you know it's going to be you know everybody uh, you know what's the song with the come you come you whatever it's called i can't remember where everybody's happy and harmony and that's not that's not how it ever will be people always no. will disagree and the point is as i've already said the point is is how you choose to deal with those disagreements how do you choose to handle those disagreements and democracy is the best way to do it a civil democracy in which people are informed and respectful. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I agree with you 100% on that. And that's, you know, part of the theme of this podcast is, you know, I I, I kind of label myself as a as an activist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's why I interview people like yourself, because of that. Um, and at the same time, you know, when I'm not interviewing somebody, and I'm doing a solo show on a, on a given mm -hmm. Wednesday. I'm still active, you know, activate, activity, activism, so, um, something. You know, was it last week? I did something on um, immigration and politics and how they don't mix and all mm -hmm. the divisiveness that's going on with that right now. And I did a show before that um, on, um, you know, abortions and and women's rights and and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So, you know, it's typically I will pick something that's front and center in the news for any given week and I'll generate a show around it and I kind of go from there because I don't want to be a niche type of podcast in that respect. Mm -hmm. I want to I want to point out all the bad things, you know. Right. Where, you know, right now today we're talking about politics. Last week it was immigration and before that it was, you know, women's rights and stuff like that. You know, I may do a show on climate activism 
you know, which I'm kind of gearing up towards maybe in a couple of weeks, you know, I'm uh -huh. kind of doing some research on that. So like I said, it, it, it comes and goes, but my point is I want to point out all of this bad stuff mm -hmm. and the device in this and figure out a way to wake. Maybe we can have civil discourse and, you know, shake hands when we get done expounding our opinions, you know, exactly. like having a couple of beers over barbecue, we may not agree on who we want to be president, but we could still shake hands and enjoy a steak together. Yeah, exactly. I mean, in fact, uh, I can remember in um, 1976, uh, I can remember uh, I was working, uh, I was a teenager, but I was doing a job of helping deliver pop and bread to rural markets. And, you know, I could have conversations with people about Jimmy Carter or Gerald Ford. And it wasn't mm. like there was the viciousness. It's it, you know, I'm thinking of voting for Ford or I'm thinking of voting for Carter. And, uh, you know, it wasn't like it is now where it's like, uh, right. you know, uh, you, you don't talk to somebody. I mean, literally, there are people who, who say, um, you know, uh, I, I don't talk to Trumpers and, and Trumpers who say I don't talk to uh, people who are not Trumpers. And we don't want yeah. that. We don't want that. You know, let's let's uh, let's be civil. Let's be respectful. Let's uh, let's get, but we have to have politicians who are not, who stick it to, the, the, who have the strategy of getting into office by identifying and exacerbating division, which is right. uh, pretty much the strategy now. And mm -hmm. uh, we, we want to get, as I say, the divisiveness and the emotion manipulation and, and the emotionally, uh, the, uh, the overcharged emotions out of the picture. Let's focus on the ideas. Let's discuss them in a civil way and let's vote on them and let's move forward. Right. So one last question for you to kind of head this out here. So what, you know, part of I got from your profile, what do you, you know, in given the current climate in the United States right mm -hmm. now, okay, versus what it was 25 years ago or 30 years ago, I mean, what do you think is America's source of greatness right now today? Well, America's, the source of America's greatness, I believe, is uh, not our military. It's not even our economy. The source of America's greatness has always been, I think, how we treat each other and mm. um, with the civility and the respect. That's what the real American spirit is. You know, I can mm. remember um, I, I lived in Japan many years. And um, one of the things that a, a Japanese person once told me, an older gentleman who was actually training to be a kamikaze pilot, um, he said that the biggest thing that made impression on him and other Japanese was when they would see the general talk to the colonel in a respectful way and the colonel talking to the major in a respectful way. Because in Japan, what it had been is the colonel, the general would insult and slap the, the colonel who would, you know, be all obsequious. And then he would turn around and go around, slap and insult the major who would mm -hmm. then turn around and on and on and down the line. It was, it was, uh, there was not an atmosphere of, of, of mutual respect, of civility. And the same thing in Germany. Uh, and so seeing the example that we set of, of our civility, and, and our principle. And, you know, we didn't go in to Japan. We didn't go into Germany with the idea of exacting revenge. We went mm. in there. We went in there with the idea of making things better, of, of helping them evolve to um, a higher level. And it's worked brilliantly in Japan and, and, and in Germany. And, mm -hmm. and it, but it, it all comes down to uh, some very fundamental ways of how we as individuals choose to to behave and right. and uh, that i think is our our source of great uh, our, our greatest strength is the uh the respect and the civility that we show one another and uh and that's in danger now it's it's it's, yes. it's definitely in danger but that is really what it, it comes down to there's um yeah so uh, i once, you know, if we have a, a, a democracy based on civility, on ideas, emotions out of the picture, uh, the freedom and the prosperity will come when we get our politicians who are in there 
to do their job, and get out, mm -hmm. no, no addiction to power, no lying, no emotion manipulating, no identifying divisive issues and trying to take advantage of them. Uh, just get in there, do your job, and uh, move the country forward. So that's what I believe our greatest, and that's what we got to work back. Going, being a country based on principles again, where we don't change our opinion if we just change the names of the people involved, or we change the political party of the people involved, or we change, uh, in some cases, the, the color of the skin of the people involved. Mm -hmm. We want to focus on principle, which is you focus on the actions, not on the individual. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with you. Well, sir, I would, I really appreciate you talking to me today. This is, this is going to go over pretty good. Well, um, this has been a true honor for me. I can't uh, begin to express just how much I've enjoyed this and how much I've enjoyed meeting you. And I certainly hope we have other opportunities to uh, discuss these issues in even more detail or, or discuss uh, issues that we weren't able to cover today. Right. Well, maybe someday I'll tell you my story about the State Department and the Iranians. <laughs> and I'll tell you my story about North Korea. Yeah, there you go. That'll work. <laughs> All right. So I'll close this out here and then I'll let you go. So my guest today was Evan Jacqua, and we had a pretty good discussion about politics and, and the United States and where we need to go versus where we are right now. Um, and with all of that, I'm going to let him go. And I appreciate you tuning in. Thank you. Thanks, you. Thank you. Care. Bye Take now. Care. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the show today. I hope you enjoyed it. And you'll return again for another episode of the Village Oak Tree. Please share this podcast with your friends and relations. The more you share, the more we can convince enough people to make the world a better place to live in. And so, Shauna Key, I hope you will continue to let me travel to your village to bring some news from the world outside that might make you think a little bit after we part for the day. So say goodbye this week. I wish to leave you with this Irish blessing as you go about your day. May the saddest day of your future be no worse than the happiest day of your past. Shlonga foil, which means goodbye for now in Irish.